last video, we saw how to generalize classification trees to include regression trees as well. We also looked at how to handle features that are continuous instead of discrete. But what are the pros and cons of using decision trees over other techniques? Well, decision trees have a reputation for transparency because they're just a bunch of if-then-else statements. And so it's very easy for a user to understand the sequence of decisions that the tree made in order to arrive at its prediction. They can also handle both discrete and continuous features, as we've seen. And so sometimes we don't need to do much data pre-processing like one-hot encoding. Another nice thing about trees is that they automatically ignore irrelevant features. The reason for this is that such features produce a gain of zero anyway, and so the tree will not split on it. And so if, say, we're trying to predict the probability of England beating New Zealand in a rugby match, and one of the features in the data set is the location of Saturn, then the tree will just not split on that feature because it would presumably have a very small gain. However, trees do have some downsides. One big downside of trees is that they can only do axis-aligned splits. Here's what we mean by that. Say we have a data set with only two classes, reds and greens. And say that the best decision boundary for this data is a diagonal line. A tree isn't going to be able to produce a sort of a decision boundary because it can only split along one single feature at a time. And so what that means is that it can only produce horizontal and vertical lines. So the decision boundary that it might come up with would look something like this. This is obviously inefficient because it needs to do around 10 splits, five in either direction, to produce this jagged decision boundary. Whereas a different technique, like say logistic regression, could instead have produced a single diagonal line for the decision boundary. Another downside is that it might not find the best tree because it's a greedy algorithm. And this issue is amplified by the fact that there exists an exponential number of potential trees. And so finding the best tree via, say, a greedy algorithm can be quite difficult. And then finally, another downside of decision trees is that they tend to overfit the data. This chart shows the accuracy of a tree as the size of the tree increases. We can see that the overfitting begins when the size of the tree surpasses around 10 nodes or so. And so how do we handle overfitting? Well, overfitting occurs when a model is so complex that it ends up fitting the noise in the data set. And so to reduce overfitting, we need to find ways of reducing the complexity of the tree. And that means reducing the number of nodes. So. How do we reduce the number of nodes in a tree? Well, we already mentioned three different solutions. One way is by setting the maximum tree height. Another way of reducing the number of nodes in a tree is by setting the maximum allowed number of splits. So uh, these two things are actually very similar to each other. Setting the maximum number of splits is the same as setting um, the maximum tree height in some sense. Because if you have a balanced tree, then your number of splits is going to grow roughly exponentially with your tree height. And then the third way of reducing the number of nodes is by setting a minimum required gain per split. And so once we've split enough times such that our gain from the splits have dropped below some predefined threshold, we can say, well, we're not really getting much mileage anymore from our added tree complexity, and so we can just stop splitting. And then yet another way of reducing the complexity of a tree is by a process called pruning. Pruning is like when you trim the branches of a tree. So what we do is build a tree on the training set. And then we check how our tree's performance on the validation set improves with each node that gets omitted. And then we just remove the node that causes the biggest decrease in performance. And then we just repeat this until we no longer see a performance improvement. But often, even this is not enough to sufficiently reduce the overfitting of a tree. So in such a case, we can turn to a more sophisticated machine learning algorithm like, say, random forests or gradient boosting. Both random forests and gradient boosting are what are called ensemble methods because the overall model 
consists of an ensemble of individual decision trees. In the case of random forests, we produce a whole ensemble of these trees by training them on randomly sampled subsets of the entire data set. And then the final model is just an average of the so-called forest of trees. And since a random forest is basically just an ensemble of individual decision trees that are trained completely independently of each other, we call this a parallel ensemble technique. On the other hand, in the case of gradient boosting, each tree in the ensemble is trained on the error of the previous trees. And so since each subsequent tree that's added to the ensemble depends on all the previous trees, we call it a sequential method. So let's look at random forests first. The first thing we do is randomly sample the data set n times to create n different random subsets. We then build a tree on each of these subsets. And while building each tree, at each node, we select a random subset of features to potentially split on. And then finally, we just average over all these trees to get a final prediction. Now let's look at a few subtleties here. The first is, how large of a subset of potential features do we consider at each split? Well, let's look at two extremes first. Let capital K be the total number of features in our data set. And let small k be the number of potential features that we might consider splitting on. If small k is equal to capital K, then it's as if we weren't even randomly sampling. So small k can't be too large. On the other hand, if we let small k is equal to 1, then it's as if we are just splitting randomly. And so k can't be too small either. And so the best choice for small k has to be somewhere in between these two extremes. It turns out that for classifiers, a good rule of thumb is to pick small k as the square root of the total number of features. Now, one thing you should note here is that random forests have two different sources of inherent randomness. The first comes from the random sampling of the data set. And the other comes from the random sampling of the feature set itself. And this is actually a very important property of random forests because it's this randomness which reduces the variance and hence reduces the propensity for overfitting. The third point to mention is how exactly do we combine the trees into a forest? For example, do we choose to do an arithmetic average over all the trees? Or instead, should we use majority voting instead? Well, for regressors, the target variable is continuous, and so majority voting makes no sense. Instead, we use the mean of the individual trees. But how about for classifiers, where the target variable can be a categorical variable? At this point, it sort of depends on what you're trying to do. If we want a probability as an output, we'll do the mean of the individual tree probabilities. But if what we want is a class as an output, we can instead do majority voting on the individual trees. But this is really more of an implementation detail, and it really differs depending on which package you're using. For example, in Python's scikit-learn library, it automatically uses the mean by default, even for classifiers. So, to broadly summarize random forests, here's how it works. We first create random subsets of the data set, and then we independently build a tree on each one of those subsets, using only a fraction of the total available features. And then, once we've made all these trees, we average over all their outputs. And that's our random forest prediction. In the next video, we're going to look at gradient boosting which is the other type of ensemble technique for trees, which we briefly mentioned.